technical difficulties. Right. Dad, can you hear me? Yeah, we're live on Facebook. Okay, well, good morning, everybody. The slaughterhouse of failure is not in our destiny. We shall persevere until we succeed. Ogmandino. Uh, today, we've chosen a, a, a subject which I think is near and close to us all. Um, and it is about the churn. In other words, the turnover, the churn that we have. And I'd like everybody to actually think about your own groups and your own individual churns and, and what's going on with that. Um, and because we've, we've all got, we've found lots of different studies and all this kind of stuff, but, but actually we, we, we need to analyze why we have such a lot of churn, if we do have churn and where it is and what it's due to. So the, the subject of this is defining happiness, how to attract and retain sellers. Dan? Yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with you guys. I put together a little PowerPoint presentation from a, um, from a 2023 social selling trends report. And I thought everything on this report Kind of, um, you know, obviously it was a, a questionnaire that was sent out, I think, to like 60 companies in the social selling space and all the executives there and uh, asked them a line of questions relating to, you know, happiness of sellers, happiness of customers, you know, how you create that culture and why people either leave or stay. And when people leave, we're calling that the churn. So, you know, we, we've all had churn. We have people that get into the business and they're excited about it. And for whatever reason, they fall off. But there's a number of reasons that they do fall off. And so I think we need to, within our own organizations, um, look at why there's so much churn, um, why people don't stay engaged. And that's so that's what we're going to talk about this morning. So, you know, the, the first thing we're going to talk about is um, actually it was 75 plus direct sales organizations that were questioned. Um, and, and what that came back with is that 15% of sellers are unhappy and 23% of organizations can prove that their field is happy. So where's the disconnect there? That's a fairly high churn rate. Um, I think it's much higher than 15%. 15% is just what they're saying are unhappy. Um, so it's, it's really important for organizations to track happiness so that they can deliver on what they've um, sold, which is the business. Um, so in a number of these slides, we're going to talk about, you know, different reasons for churn, different reasons for unhappiness, you know, wh where those percentages lie and what we can do to increase those percentages or decrease those percentages to have a, a much more happy organization, a, a less churn and keep how to keep more people engaged. And so when you're looking at onboarding, you know, there's a lot of outdated onboarding programs and 50% of the people that respond to this questionnaire said that they don't recommend that sellers start with the corporate onboarding. And then 46% um, think that the field is unsatisfied with the current onboarding programs. And I, I personally, with my organization, would say that, you know, I, I'm, I'm in that 46% that thinks that we don't have a great onboarding program. Um, and so what that does is that leads to field retention or churn. So, you know, the reasons that most people quit within the first 30 days are, number one, not knowing what to do. And number two, they haven't made a sale. So, so if we can just focus on those two variables, you know, explaining and onboarding people on what to do very quickly to get started, that is going to help with number two, which is generating a sale. There's, there, people are much more likely when they get into direct selling to, to stay with it if they make a sale or see a sale within the first 30 days. Lawrence? Did Lawrence fall off? Okay. I don't see him on here anymore. So we're going to move on. Um, you know, from the point of view of the sellers, the biggest challenge is converting connections into customers not necessarily bringing people onto the team. And then what, how do you, once you get those customers, happiness and sharing happiness um, is what's going to keep those folks 
um, engaged, uh, not only with the products and keep them happy with the products, but also keep them happy with the service. So, you know, what is the most important, what are the most important skill sets from the point of view of sellers in, in creating a happy organization and a success, successful organization? 46% of those people say that consistency is key which we talk about all the time, remaining consistent, whether it's in recruiting for the business or talking to people about uh, our products and how they can improve their lives. And then 44% say that the most important skill is relationship building. Sales is relationship building. People buy from people that they like, that people that they trust. Um, so that's all kind of from the point of view of sellers. And then from the point of view of, of corporate, you know, their top priorities for 2023 based on this questionnaire is, is field retention. How are they going to create that happiness? How are they going to create those first sales that keep uh, people engaged um, from a distributor standpoint? But also, how do you keep that retention high for customers? And, um, and only 50% have high visibility on sales, um, high visibility on well-being, meaning that that's a focus point for them. So, I think there's some things within our own organizations, within New Skin Pharmanix, that are coming down the pike as far as these new, um, new AI and everything that's going to be incorporated into the app and customer retention that are going to help with a lot of this. But in the meantime, we need to be focusing on some of these variables that we can control. Lawrence? You're muted, I believe. Yeah, okay. So, I'm sorry. So... I think when we look at statistics and we look at numbers and we look at what we're doing and we look at information that we impart, when we look at trainings, when we look at all of these different things, I think one of the biggest things that we overlook is the human factor. And when we talk about social mm -hmm. selling, and we talk about social selling, we're talking about a completely different business to what everybody is used to doing. Lawrence, I'm sorry, I muted you. I was trying to mute some other people. We are having all kinds of technical difficulties this morning. Lawrence, I, I muted you. You might have to unmute again. All right. I'm sorry about that. No problem. So, so, um, so what, what I'm trying to say is that we are armed with a lot of information with a lot of um, uh, studies, a lot of uh, trainings, a lot of everything. But one thing we tend to overlook is the human factor. Because we have all the information, we have the technology, we have the products, we have the proven system, we have everything. Well, then why do we have this churn? We look at statistics and voluntary churn, involuntary churn, one of the biggest things, in my opinion, is the human factor. The human factor is we've got to bear in mind that a lot of these people come from corporate America. A lot of us come from corporate America. We've never had, we've never done any kind of networking or network marketing. We never needed to. You know, when we've gone to a cocktail, we've just had a drink and had dinner and talked about golf. But now we're talking about something more. We're talking about, you know, trying to look at not our selling our business, but it's a different kind of life. And we need to understand that I we need to understand the human factor. We need to be more empathetic. We need to be more, you know, we say we don't like to hold people's hands and make them do it. And they've just got to understand it. They're all grown men. They're all grown women. They know what to do. No, they don't. And a lot of people actually do need to be uh, listened to because we talk to a lot of people we have a lot of calls to people, but we don't actually listen to see what it is that's making them happy. The whole point of this exercise today was the pursuit of happiness. That's paramount in any business, in any organization, is if you feel happy and, 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 and um, uh, tranquil, happy if you're in your business. And so serene is the word I'm looking for, serene and happy, and you're happy about it. That's the, obje the, the objective and not just about money because somebody may not be interested in just the money. They, money doesn't bring happiness. Money is just an element to it. 
So I think we've got to look at all of these statistics and pick them to pieces and have a look and see what it is that, um, you know, for example, some people are kinetic, some people are visual, some people are, are um, audio. I remember my dad was, was always angry, not angry, but he was always like critical of his, some of his managers because they would take notes. And he would say, but I've told them 15 times. Yeah, but you didn't show them. You didn't explain, you didn't show them physically how to do it. So a lot of people, we've got to understand who the people we are that we're communicating with so that we can have less churn. And I think if we listen to people, we recognize the feelings to make them feel good. Yeah, and we need to understand these two ty types of churn because one I think we can control and the other I, I think we can't control. So voluntary churn is, you know, when they... Um, when a seller chooses to leave the company for whatever reason, you know, there's some examples here, you know, they don't like the products anymore. They're no longer interested in social selling or they don't need the opportunity anymore. You know, if we solve their pain with the opportunity and then that pain goes away, whether the opportunity or they get another job somewhere else, I don't think we can really control that that much. So we need to focus on the involuntary churn. It's harder to identify uh, because most people aren't going to come out and tell you why they're having difficulty. Um, but how do we get them to come to us when they're ha having difficulty? Um, so there's some examples here of why they may feel like they have no other option but to quit. So, you know, they feel like they've tried everything and aren't seeing results. They don't feel supported by the company, not sure what to do to get started, or they don't know how to progress. So, you know, that comes back to, you know, the onboarding and then helping them get their first sale, right? That's something that we can control by spending more time with them and kind of holding their hand until they get past those initial hurdles. So I think it's important to focus on that involuntary churn. Um, when people feel like you know they're lost, they don't really know how to progress in the business, we need to show them how to progress in the business. We need to show them how to make a sale. You know, I had a, an example when I was in medical device sales where I was asking one of my um, one of the, the people a little bit lower than me, you know, I gave him the opportunity to sell. He was just kind of an account manager at the time. And it, I gave him one product and I said, why don't you spend the next three months talking to physicians at this account and seeing if you can get them to sell, uh, get them to, to purchase the product and start using it. And he tried for three months and I can't, you know, I watched what he was doing and he came back after three months and he said, uh, I, I don't know what I'm doing wrong, but nobody seems to be interested in this product. And I said, all right, come with me. Let's have a conversation. So I took him over to a doctor. There was a doctor at the scrub sink getting ready to go in and do surgery and I went up to her and I said, hey, you know, you've been using X bone cement from another company. I think we have a better product. This is Y, X, Y, Z. And I, and, and I knew the one thing that most salespeople don't do is ask for the sale. And so that's exactly what I did. I asked, will you start trying this product and see if it's a right fit and it's going to work in your hands for your patients? And she said, absolutely, yes. And so we walked out of the scrub sink and I said, did you ever ask that? any of those physicians for the business? And he said, no. And I was like, well, how can you expect them to, to use your product if you don't ask them to use it? You've been spewing you know, product facts, features, and benefits, but you've never asked them for the business. They're not going to ask you to use that. So sometimes we need to you know, get together with our teams, a team member that's maybe, maybe struggling, do some more three-way calls with them, and, and actually show them how to make a sale. And then once you've shown them how to make a sale, it's a system, right? And then, and then they feel more comfortable having the conversation, dealing with objections and all of those things. And that, that's what, that's, you just hit it on the head. You, you took this guy and you said, this, okay, this is the product, the same product that I'm selling somewhere else. This is how you do it, go and do it. And after a few months, he came back and he said, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. And you said, come with me and I'll show you. And I think, I think this is something that, that is lacking in what we do because we, it took you a couple of months to realize, or he came back to you to tell you that he wasn't successful. And it's when you took him with you, and I'm not suggesting we take people with us somewhere, but I'm saying that we should, be, we should have a more a closer communication and dialogue about what went well, what didn't go well with the people that in our teams so that we have a, a, a pulse on where they are, 
why are they feeling frustrated if they are and why are they feeling happy if they are in other words what was the success what was that due to let's analyze it let's actually make them understand what's going on because sometimes we 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 we, we make a when i say we make a sale we make a sale we, yay we made a sale well okay what did we do right there oh it, we didn't we did the same as everybody as we did before it was a different customer it was a different mentality it was a different person so we've got to get the feedback and we've got to understand understand what it is that's going on you said ask for the sale you know that's something that you're quite right a lot of people don't ask for the sale i had a call with somebody yesterday he the person was ready to go right now and he said we will chat next week no we won't what time this afternoon can we can we fill it the fill out the form the the sales uh, the scanner agreement so urgency all of these things i think are dialogue uh, absolutely and when you know when people first come into the business that's when their excitement is at the highest right and so that's the time that we need to address these issues that lead to involuntary churn so we need to focus on the root cause of this involuntary churn and so we need to improve the seller experience you know people that are on our team and then when we improve the seller experience they're going to be happy and that's going to translate into their happiness and their excitement is going to translate over to the customer which is going to improve the customer experience so that's you know we sometimes we focus on the right things sometimes we focus on the wrong things um i myself am am guilty of this you know focusing on the sale and maybe not focusing on the folks on my team uh, as much as i probably should so you know what this whole thing tells me and there's about 30 slides we're only going to cover about 10 of them um but i did drop it into the chat for you that want to take a look at the whole thing but we need to start to focus on the right things to to to, to reduce this involuntary churn and so, you know, for me, the hardest part of this um, process is actually bringing people on board, right? Getting them to say, yes, I want to engage in this business. Yes, I want to spend $2,600 to get this, to be able to have the uh, ability to have the scanner, to be able to go and show people what we have, right? That's the hard part. The easy part should be nurturing these folks and onboarding them. And we're working on the onboarding. I still don't think it's necessarily where it needs to be. Um, but maybe that's something that we could work on as a as a broader group where we do a weekly onboarding and somebody does that every week. I mean, we do it on our team. We do an eight week course. John Schwartz does a fantastic job with that. Um, is it is it you know with most things? Is it the best that it's ever going to be? Probably not. So, you know, the more minds we can bring together to solve this problem and and create a system a true system of onboarding people and helping them to understand and and bringing the experience of people like Jim Trainer and Vince Miranda and Joe Scalia um, Michael Cook to the, to those calls is going is what's going to help people um be happier with that process of knowing what to do rather than just sit there with their scanner and looking through studies and saying okay this is great but I don't know what to do to get this in front of customers Right. And, and so we need to focus more on the happiness of our team members, uh, which is going to lead to them going out, selling, getting their first sale, being happy because they've made a sale, which is going to propel them further to be successful. Yeah. So, so I think, again, it's about the, the interaction. It's about feedback. It's about being able to impart the information in a way which everybody can understand so somebody says my I did exactly the same thing I went to, to this person and they said this or that the onboarding the onboarding should be in my opinion a completely two-way street it's not just here's all the stuff here's all the literature here's how you do it this is what you've got to do get on with it and some of us and I am guilty of that I've always been a self-starter. I just do my own thing. And I've been guilty of not understanding adequately the apprehensions of the person that I'm talking to. I assumed that he or she was going to just do what I did. Just go ahead and do it. Get on with it. But it isn't like that. And everybody is different. And we've got to understand the psychology behind each person. Everybody is different. 
and everybody's got a different priority. Everybody's got a different concept about, about the business. I want to do it because I want more time with my kids. I want to do it more because I got I need more money. I want to put my kids through college, whatever it is. But everybody's perspective can be different. And we've got to understand that so that we actually have that state of happiness. That's the whole underlining thing about all of this that we're talking about is the state of happiness of the person. Yeah, absolutely. And that's going to improve that seller experience. You know, the people on our team that we're relying on to go out and build this business. <coughs> you know? So, you know, how do we improve the seller experience? There's a bunch of different um, things that we can look at. And some of these things we actually do really well, but some of these things I think we're lacking. Um, so, so when you think about field well-being, you know, are you fostering a community on your team? You know, does everybody feel like they're included? Um, you know, connecting sellers with other sellers and, and corporate, we do that great. We do a great healthcare forum, right? To bring sellers to learn more about the products, interact with the company. And then, you know, one of the other ones is the strength spotting. You know, what are the strengths and what are the weaknesses of our team members? And how do we bring those strengths and, and ha have them benefit everybody? You know, and then how do we help them develop professionally through continuous learning, right? And then most important, you know, Lawrence and I just talked about this other the other day. How do we margin? How do we champion those marginalized groups? You know, those people that aren't maybe as engaged in the business as we would like them to be. How do we champion them with the rest of the team to get to bring them up to the level of everyone else, right? So actually, there's something there too. For example, if you think about it as a, as a medical device rep or a pharma rep, and you go and you have your monthly meeting or whatever you have, it's you against everybody else because everybody's trying to get, you know, the, the, uh, the ear of the, of the, of the boss. And, this, and they all are with guarded cards. I mean, not, not everybody's going to just go there and let it all hang out and say, this is what I've done. This is what I'm doing. This is what I did well. This is what I did bad. Because he doesn't want everybody else to copy him. In this case, we're, we're trying to make a team where everybody has on that team has, this, has, the, same, has the same goal of helping the, the person on his or her team. It's not just me against everybody else. It's us. It's we, let's. It's about us making a, 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 having a success. So it's team, the real team. And that's where communication comes in again. And it all comes down to onboarding, in my, my personal opinion. If we're onboarding people correctly, if they're going through and doing everything, or if they're completing the onboarding, if they're, you know, finishing everything correctly, they're doing a step-by-step -step fashion, if they're taking action, if we're showing them how to take action, you know, are they being pr productive? You know, are they retaining the knowledge of, of the material that they need to actively sell? You know, and how many times have we, uh, any, everyone on this call say this, you can't improve what you can't measure, right? So if you're not measuring this onboarding process and, and the success rate, then how do you really know if it's working? I mean, I'm the first one to tell you that I'm not a guy to read directions. If I get something that needs to be put together, I don't read the directions. I throw, I'm throw. i the first one to throw the directions away and just figure it out. Um, but that's, that's not everybody. A lot of people need, need that direction. A lot of people need that um, organized onboarding. And I think we're working on that. I think we need to work on that and continually update it and make it as good as we possibly can. That's how we're going to have the highest retention rate and have the happiest sellers in our organizations. So this particular slide that you've got there, Dan, is I think one of the key ones for us to look at and dissect individually, uh, even after the call, how many sellers have completed the training. This is important. Like you say, for example, you don't go through the instructions. I don't either. And that's, 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 it could be a failure for some people not to go through this thing very completely and for, not, for us not to, not to have them accountable. Did you do this? Did you go through this? What did you think about it? Tell me your comments. What do you think you can do? What do you think you can't do? You know, what sections of onboarding um, 
I'm trying to make this bigger. Do don't stop halfway. We were talking about this yesterday or last week. Don't do things half-assed. If you're going to do something, do it complete. Did you do it complete? All of these different points are essential, I think. Yeah, and then we have to look at the you know the whole life cycle of the onboarding. You know, are we celebrating success? Are we focusing on an outcome uh, one at a time? Are we bringing our team members the information that they need in the in a timely manner? Um, you know, it's been shown over and over that companies that invest in smart onboarding have an advantage over their competitors because of that this ability to predict this, this churn. You know, this life cycle journey. So, you know, expectation is one thing, reality is another thing, and then reality plus in effective onboarding. You know, that's where you're going to build a, a team that's going to be really, really successful. The most, the most treasured possession we have is time. And it's better to invest the time correctly from the beginning with everybody than try and keep on trying to fix something en route. It's a waste of time. I'm trying to look. So, so this this was a great slide um, that I wanted to share with you, and this is probably going to be the last one. But fifteen percent of sellers are unhappy and at risk of churning. Seventy seven percent of social selling companies have no way of knowing who these people are and why they're unhappy. So we need to figure out why these people are unhappy, whether it be at a corporate level um, or um, in our own organizations, because happy happy people. Um, equals a prospering company or a prospering organization. Happy sellers equal higher retention rate, equal consistent sales. And, and then if you look at some of these metrics down below, 83% of millennials say work-life balance is the most important factor when considering a job. 37% greater sales are produced by happy salespeople. So are you keeping the people in your organization happy and engaged in what we're doing? So the thing is, how do you measure happiness? Well, how do you, how do you know that it's, they're unhappy? Because then they are part of the churn. If they're happy, they're working, they'll call all the time, they're on, the, on it all the time. They're enthusiastic. People are, are passionate, enthusiastic. Happiness has a link to, to results, positive results. And that's what we've got to strive for. You know, based on this survey and the trends in 2023, you know, these are the these are the um, these are the things that make people happy. You know, the products are good products; they work. You're fostering a culture of community. You you have the support that you need from corporate, and you're helping people. Right? How many times have every one of us on this call said that the reason we got into this business because not necessarily because of the, maybe the money, but because it gives us the opportunity to help people. And then there's, you know, pe reasons why people aren't happy, you know, poor communication within the organization, poor communication from corporate to the, to the sellers. You know, we promised them a culture community, but, but we didn't really fall, follow through on that. Right. And, and that's one of the things that I actually talk to people about when every time I talk to somebody about the business, I talk to them about the sense of community that we have. And then there's, you know, um, this is an obvious one. Are you providing support to your downline, right? As an upline or a sponsor, that's your job is to provide that support. And then is the, is the training outdated or there's no real training? You know, that, those are the things that are going to uh, lead to that high churn and voluntary churn rate. When people have, you know, one or two of these um, categories, in, in the unhappy. Um, yeah, it, it just, needs yeah. One, just needs one of those to, to have a problem. Well, if we look at all of these things, and I think we need to analyze these as well. For example, let's look at why aren't on set, why people aren't happy. We look at why people aren't happy. We look at poor communication, promised culture, community, no support from corporate up to outdated training. If we look at those, well, the, the outdated training, no, we have that. Support from corporate or from upline, we have that. That's not a problem. Promised culture, we've got huge promised culture coming up of really interesting stuff. Poor communication, 
we come back. I always insist on that is the biggest problem that we, we have is if we don't communicate adequately and, and with, with understanding who we are communicating with and not to. That, that's probably the biggest um, problem in most organizations and most companies is communication, poor communication. So, you know, these are the four things that we should be focused on to be keeping our organization happy, um, which is then going to lead to less churn, which leads to um, higher retention rate of customers because the customers are happier. And this whole AI thing that's coming down the pike in the next 12 to 18 months, you know, that's going to hopefully do a lot of that for us. Um, you know, this, it, what I believe it's going to do is help us get people um, who are new to the organization up and selling quicker. It's going to make that sell, sell easier. And then that's going to, it's going to also be able to nurture these buyers and make happier customers. So any, any questions? I know we're running a little bit past 10 o'clock. Dan, I just wanted to make a comment. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. Um, great call, great information. Uh, really awesome. I mean, we need to conduct periodic interviews before we do any exit interviews. If we talk about onboarding and churning and people leaving. And when people come on board and they're excited and they get that first sale and they're on a high for doing it, that needs to be celebrated. You know, uh, I, <laughs> I had an upline when I got my first LOI, he said, even a blind squirrel finds a nut. That was not the way to uh, congratulate somebody from getting their first uh, scanner placed. But, you know, you look at Andre Mills was on the phone over here. And I saw the other day on Facebook that he was congratulated to come on board. And his upline was, you know, happy and excited and announced that for him. And now I see his name over here on the call. And I'm acknowledging him for being on the call. I have never met him. I don't even know whose upline is, but it's fantastic that he's here and those nice. little blips of acknowledgement not only in the beginning when you're sorry for the word courting somebody but whatever you were doing as far as innovation to get that person into your business and if you look at it as dating you were really innovative when we first start dating but then it kind of wears off and what's the one of the best advice you can give is never stop dating Keep that person plugged in. Keep that person feeling special. My, the upline who brought in Stephen, who I work closely with, said, we should be talking every day. Actually, Stephen said it when I first came on board. He said, we should be talking every day. Yes. And, and that's important because you get to hear the struggles. Because the main reasons why people drop out, I'm sorry, I wasn't able to read your screens here. I, I did look at voluntary versus uh, involuntary churn, is that they feel overwhelmed is number one. And another reason is that they're not clear on what they need to do. So until someone gets their first sale, their next sale, consistent sales, and then able to scale, it is correct. It's our responsibility to get to that point. I love what Vince put down just now. What would your organization look like if everybody in your organization did what you were doing? He's a leader by example. He drives and all over the place to show people that he has the grit to make this business happen. And if it's going to be, it's up to him. And, and leading by example is so important. And the more involved logically go to social media, the more primitive it is where we need to connect with people on a personal note and make them feel part of a culture and help them and coach them through to success that they say they wanted when they first started and reminding them that you're here to help them get what they want. Joe, One thing you. we did and we did was really successful in my other teams, I've, I've, you know, like I said, I've been, been in this industry for 20 years, is you have the immediate culture that you build, but then you have like an isolated culture that you make people want to become a part of. And so with that, our other team was like executive director, like here, Ruby was the pinnacle. We would have executive director. We'd all go skydiving and you couldn't go skydiving unless you were an executive director or we were doing an executive director launch. Hey, you got to hit, you got to hit Ruby this month because you want to be a part of what we're all the Rubies are going to go do. And you the make tribe. these pinnacle breakthroughs to give people to, to strive for because the people want to be a part of something and you just don't want, you know, all the looky loos just to be able to hang out. So you have your immediate culture that, you know, we, we foster, but then we create what we call the isolated culture where you have to, you have to, you know, become a part of, you, you know, you just don't get to, you got to finish the race across the finish line. And so just something that may, it helps people stick around longer because I want to be a part 
of man, y'all are doing all this stuff. Yeah, you got to hit this position because you have to be a Ruby or whatever that whatever that um, that quota is. And so sometimes when you put that out there, people will strive for that, and you give them something outside the position itself to run for. Hey, this is our group of people. This is our Ruby people. Like you know, they do that with the blue diamonds at the upper echelon. So that's something as a group like we could bring that bar down locally or like hey you got to be lapis or whatever it is come utah and then we have the group that goes to the the lapis party whatever it is and we just make an isolated culture which strives people to want to do something so they can be part of something because that that will sometimes push people out of their comfort zone actually i just want to comment on something you just said they want to be part of kevin kellen said something a couple of weeks ago um that really resonated uh, and I'm just going to modify it a little bit. We are always recruiting. We see somebody and we think, wow, he would be great or she would be great in this business. And we ask the questions and they are, it looks like a perfect fit. But we don't make them want to be in the business. We're recruiting them. And they've got to want to be in this. They're going to want to be in it. And if they want to be in it, they will be asking questions. How can I do this better? How can I do that better? Because if we're talking to someone that we've recruited and that, you know, we think we, we think they're going to be fantastic, unless they really want to, we're just going to be pushing and pushing and pushing. They've got to be, and in, in fact, if we've got some of the people in our organizations that are actually pulling us to go to, to help them forward. So, you know, it's 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 we've got to make people understand that the onboarding is not just something that you know we've got to go here. Yes, How badly do you want this? Do you really want to be part of this? That's what we've got. To, that's the first part of it. And sometimes you need to remind them why they got involved in the business in the first place because people have short-term memories. You know they forget what the pain was when they get involved, and that maybe is adds a different level of pain because they're uncomfortable. They're uncomfortable getting outside of their comfort, comfort zone, or they don't know what to do next. They don't know where to get started, but we need to, you know, we need to constantly be reminding them why they decided to engage in this opportunity in the first place. And that's why the, the process of onboarding them or the process of, of recruiting has to be more of an interview. It has to be yes. something we are considering whether they are worthy of joining our team yes and express that to them 100 percent. We've, we've gone you know that's a conversation that michael and lawrence and i have had you know we were going we were we were talking to people after one call and offering them the job how many that never happens in the corporate world you go no. through a process of different interviews with different people and they give you the okay, either the okay or the no K, okay, you know? So we, we need to think about how we're doing that recruiting process, because if you're, if you're excited the first time you talk to them and say, you'd be an awesome fit for this. Yeah. We'd love you to join our team. There's nothing special about it, right? You have to make them excited about it and really want to join your team and feel like only the, you know, a certain percentage of people that fit the criteria are getting offered the job. Yeah, we love you. I, mean, I do that. Like I said, I'm not trying to recruit everybody, you know, and, you know, ask people, you know, like you said, you know, why should I work with you? I'm busy. Why should I take my time to help you and make them sell you? We're so, you know, it's kind of like the thing when then I hear people do it. Oh, you'd be so great. You do this, that, like, that's like, okay, no. And it's like, well, explain to me what, what value you're going to bring into here. Explain to me what you can do here. And I think people confuse joining the business with doing the business. And so, um that then that's one thing i i i shoot off a couple of my friends i'm like hell no i don't want to deal with you and then my friends i was like i don't want you in this because like like god last thing i want to do is have to deal with you for the next two years in this so don't confuse to think that you want everybody you know spend more time just getting them to sell you and like why should i take my time i'm busy i'm doing this thing and for me to take off to misdirect what are you going to bring to the table for me to give you my time and jim Rohn talks about that teach people to deserve your time Go ahead, Martin. I jumped in on you there, Martin. Go ahead. Sorry. No, I, I was going to say pretty much the same thing because uh, I, I think the answer is, and maybe it's a way that we change how we onboard people. And perhaps it's, uh, it's Lawrence saying, look, we'd love you to join our team. I think you'd be a great fit. But first, you have to pass muster with 
two or three of my colleagues. Um, when would when could we have the next interview? Call it an interview. It's not a bad thing. We've actually started doing that. And, Good. And and uh, we've 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 started to to be very selective about that. We say, well, you know, we'll get my business partner because he's the one who who will finally approve or disapprove. And so, you know, then we kind of hang on a little bit and make them wait a little bit so that they really want it. Because otherwise, we're out there. You know, my wife once said to me, stop being like a puppy and be like a cat. And we're all puppies, you know, we're out there like yeah. a puppy, instead of being suave like a cat and saying, well, I don't know if we really want you here, you know. And, and so I think that is a valid observation too. We're not in a hurry to, 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 there are thousands of people out there looking for something. Why yeah. should we interview everybody? No, let's be selective. Let's be, let's see who it is that we who it is that really wants to be this, wants to do this. And he doesn't have to be a medical rep or a farmer rep. Could be an entrepreneur. Could be anybody else. But he needs to want to do it. If you yeah. jump like a puppy and you lick somebody all over their face, you totally devalue the opportunity here. Yes and your role in it and your time in it. And, and, and that is not likely to be a person that sticks because they won't perceive the value. Yes. Give me four people to run with versus 100, 100 people to carry. Yeah, amen. There you go. Uh, I, I'm looking for events. Does anybody know where I can find events or John Swartz? <laughs> yeah. You know, once you put them through the process though, um, it's kind of like the Navy SEALs. Remember the book, Extreme Ownership. Once you put them through that process, you're really saying, I'm making this commitment to you as well. And so you have to take extreme ownership. And, and you're willing to do that if you've interviewed them well and you've had your colleagues interview them and, and they really pass muster and you feel like this is, this is somebody that's really going to go after this business. They're going to run into their walls and you need to be there to help them get over those or around those walls once they once they engage. To understand how big the wall was, if it was a wall and it was a wall in the person's mind or if it really was a wall. You see that most of the walls are in their mind. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, we want to wrap it up. Lawrence is 1017. Oh, wow. Well, thanks, everybody. Anybody else want to add anything or not? Then, otherwise, thank you for your time, everybody. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, everybody, for your input. Don't take the weekend off. Go to work. <laughs> there you go. All right, Dan, do you miss, Dan, do you, do you miss your beard, Dan? What's that? Do you miss your beard? Uh, uh, no, not really. <laughs> I see the mustache is there. I was actually giving my license and registration. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Really appreciate your time. We'll see everybody next uh, Friday at the same time. Have a good night. Have a great weekend. Right. Great call, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.